evening and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Kim Hatza and I'm a business attorney and partner at Millcrest Law in Radnor, Pennsylvania. I focus my practice in the areas of technology, life sciences, and healthcare. Tonight we're continuing our special series on life sciences, technology, and healthcare leaders in the Delaware Valley. Before we get started, I want to remind our viewers that from time to time we will, we will be discussing financial issues relating to technology, healthcare, or life sciences companies. These discussions are not and should not be viewed as financial advice. Moreover, since the show is pre-recorded and shown at a later time, the information may no longer be current. You should always speak with your financial advisor before entering into any financial transaction. I'm happy to have with me this evening my co-host Charlie Huntington. Charlie is the head of public relations for Pennsylvania Bio. Pennsylvania Bio is the voice of advancement for the biosciences in Pennsylvania. Charlie, thanks for co-hosting. Pleasure. Thanks, Kim. Well, since this is our December show, I was in a reflective mood uh, as I was thinking about the show, and I thought, well, this has been a big year for Pennsylvania Bio, uh, a, lot of, a lot of big events, uh, very successful events. I was thinking that maybe you might want to take a few minutes and sort of recap some of the highlights of the year, and if, and if you uh, want to also uh, give us a preview of what might be coming up in the near term and perhaps even uh, long term. Be happy to. Thanks, Kimmon. Sure. So, uh, as you may know, Pennsylvania Bio has grown tremendously. Uh, under Chris Molyneux's uh, time with Pennsylvania Bio as president and CEO, um, he's doubled the size of Pennsylvania Bio, so it's gone from 300 members when he took it over about six years ago to now there are 600 members. The membership has changed uh, as well, so there are far more device companies, far more healthcare IT companies, and far more um, uh, clinical research organizations than there were five, six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big plus and uh, you know we have uh, uh, we've started talking about is the word bio still appropriate when you look at our our membership so stay tuned for that. Okay. Um, with regard to the industry events that we've had there has pretty much been a breakfast program uh, every month. Uh, normally those are done at the Desmond or at the Crown Plaza in King of Prussia. Uh, very well attended, 200 people attend. Any of our, our audience who'd like to attend, you're welcome to come out and be a part of that. Check the Pennsylvania Bio website, which is pennsylvaniabio.org, and uh, you can figure out what the current calendar looks like. The two, I'd like to highlight two Pennsylvania Bio events that happened over the last year, as well as one international bio event. I'll start with the international bio event. The International Bio Event attracted Philadelphia, hosted the International Bio Event this year. Mm -hmm. uh, this was back during the beginning of the summer. We had over 17,000 people attend this conference from all over the world. Um, we were recently rewarded, the city of Philadelphia was rewarded with the 2019 convention, which is a big deal yeah. because up until now, they've rotated this amongst just a couple cities mm -hmm. that you may be familiar with, Boston, San Diego, San Francisco, Chicago had it a few years, they've been to Atlanta, but it looks like we could potentially be in the permanent rotation every four or five yeah, years, would which great. would be outstanding for the region. Mm -hmm. um, it makes complete sense when you look at the breadth of pharma and, and uh, healthcare IT and medical device and biotech prowess that we have in the region. So. Um, I'll highlight two programs that we had. These are Pennsylvania bio programs. One was the spring dinner, which typically happens in the March or April time frame. And there were a thousand people down at the convention center for that. It was very well attended. Um, we had national uh, political figures as a part of it and, and uh, many different awards. And, and that's something that folks should get involved with. In the fall, a uh, month ago, we did our two-day symposium. So one day is focused more on small companies and uh, more like the bench scientist, and then the other day is more uh, of a global come one, come all, and, and uh, network with, with your, you know, your, uh, the people who you should uh, be in contact with to help you with your business. So 
Uh, it's been a great year. Looking forward to, to next year and 2019 when we host the International Convention again. That would be exciting. Well, thank you very much for the recap, Charlie. Sure. I'd, uh, we have a great guest tonight. I would like to, I'm anxious to get into our questions for him. Uh, I do want to remind our viewers, though, that if you have a question for us that you'd like us to answer on a future show, here's how you do it. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, TV dot com. It's with uh, great pleasure that I introduce our special guest this evening, Tim Schaefer. Tim currently serves as the president and CEO of SafeAwake, a safety products company. He also serves as the president, CEO, and chairman of InnoFect, a medical device and specialty pharmaceutical company, volunteering his time as a Penn alum through the PCI Ventures program led by John Swartley and Michael Poizel at the University of Pennsylvania. He began his career as a process engineer for Rutgers Nice Chemical Company and moved on to engineering ro roles with increasing responsibility for each of Pinnacle Technologies, Cambrex Corporation, and Lonza Group before becoming the plant manager and site manager for Minrad International, a specialty pharmaceutical manufacturer and liquid packaging and distribution company for inhalation anesthetics. Tim received his BS in chemical engineering from Bucknell University, his MS and his Master in Philosophy from Penn in Organizational Dynamics, specializing in project management, strategy, leadership, and launching new ventures, and also received an executive master's from Penn in technology man management from the engineering school, which was co-sponsored by Wharton. Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kamal, and thank you, Charlie, for having me here tonight. It's our great pleasure. Um, could you tell our viewers just a little bit about your uh, early career in engineering? Uh, yes. I graduated from Bucknell University and then in central Pennsylvania. Then I moved to State College, Pennsylvania, and went to work for Rutgers Nice, uh, subsidiary of the German firm Rutgers Works in Germany, and started working in the plant as a process engineer. They were a contract manufacturing organization, meaning they had other clients that they made intermediates and chemicals for, and their specialty was fine chemicals. From there, I went and joined Pinnacle Technologies. It was a startup company. I was the first employee. I was a project engineer in the R&D laboratory. They were a custom formulator for electronic materials, uh, both epoxy resin-based and thick film paste. Uh, after that, I went to Cambrex Corporation, moved out to Holland, Michigan, right next to Lake Michigan there, um, and worked for a specialty chemical firm. And what they did was made it, uh, raw materials for pharmaceutical companies that made the active ingredients. Uh, I worked as a process engineer in the plant for several years and then I also became production engineer. At about the time I became production engineer, I had an opportunity to come to Philadelphia and work for Lonza. Lonza is a uh, Swiss-based firm and they were in pharmaceutical contract manufacturings and they made uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, both solids and liquid based materials that went into the final drug compounding. So I we moved here and I went to work in the plant and even though I was an operations manager I still had to spend a lot of my time in the engineering and overseeing a lot of engineering and working with the engineers uh, but from a perspective that I actually got to coordinate a lot of the processes and production in the plant and solve the day-to-day -day, uh, production issues that yes. had come up. Is Lanza in, the, in Conshohocken? Is that where they yes, are? Yes, it's r located right here in Conshohocken, okay. uh, across from the GlaxoSmithKline facility along okay. the river. I, yes. I thought, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But no. uh, and uh, after that opportunity, I uh, joined a company called Minrad uh, International up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It was a restart of an older firm, almost like a startup. Uh, what they did was manufactured, packaged, and distributed inhalation anesthetics uh, globally. I served as plant manager there for several years, still working in uh, engineering capacity to a certain extent, uh, bringing uh, some new uh, generic drugs online. 
after that, I went into like a consulting base and uh, joined Safe Awake down in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, what they do. Can I just interrupt yes. you for a second. How um, I'm always interested in how people seem to sort of change careers. So you were you were an engineer, a, you know, a chemical engineer, and then you really moved to the management side to do management consulting, like you're doing CEO now for Safe Awake yes. and for In Effect. What lead? What led to a transition like that, or was it not much of a transition at all for you? Well, when I when I graduated from school at Bucknell, I went right to Penn State University and got an associate's degree in management, and was building my base to go back and get my MBA. And later in my career, when I was in Michigan, I used to go part time to school at the University of Chicago MBA school. I never had the opportunity to finish because I then relocated here to Philadelphia, and that's when I started going to Penn. But I always knew I wanted to get in management at Cam. I had my first opportunity to actually be a shift supervisor and from there worked my way up through the ranks. And it gave me a larger perspective of how an organization is run and really the systematic thinking that's necessary to look at all the different aspects when you're making decisions as a leader in the organization or running a plant. And from the plant scale, I would say moving into the CEO positions later, uh, I started off at Minrad was the best area. When I worked there, um, Bill Burns, John McNear, and Ross Terrell, they gave me the opportunity to attend the board meetings and get involved, present to the board, uh, meet investors, uh, go out and uh, talk to different customers and clients and distributors. And we, that's what got me into more the management side and helped with the transition. I enjoyed the supply chain management side at that time in my career. Um, then when I left there, I went to Safe Awake, and now I became the CEO. I was a member of the board for the first time. I was actually, uh, I had to set the vision for the company, the strategy, and being a small company, I had to actually execute. And I continued to do that on an annual basis and work with that team. And I had a, you know, a great chairman of the board coaching me, uh, Al Leonard. But I also learned there that a uh, um, gentleman, Al Leonard, he was a professor at University of Penn who introduced me to the firm. He wrote a book called The Power of Product Platforms, and it's making products good, better, and best. I had his knowledge to help me grow and learn more on the marketing, sales, and business development side. And he was also known for launching consumer products. He launched the Sears Workmate Bench he's credited with and a Dustbuster, two of the top wow, selling wow. consumer <laughs> products. So that helped develop me being his understudy during that time. And he was on the board helping us grow this company. And I was able to take that then to InnoFect when I joined them. Can you talk a little bit about the, the origins of InnoFect and how you like, first got involved with it? Uh, yes. Um, I, was, I was working at Safe Wake and then I was down at UPenn. I was attending an event. And I had the opportunity to learn about this Upstart Pen program. Mm -hmm. And they had these companies, and I was introduced to Mike Purcell. I reviewed a lot of the companies there. And the one I picked out that I liked was in this infectious disease area called InnoFect. It was a device and actually a hand sanitizer. So we had a razor and blade model for the business side of it. So it kind of excited me there. And then Dr. Paul Axelson was the inventor. He was a world-renowned. Uh, infectious disease doctor. He's an expert witness. So I thought, wow, here's something maybe we can get going, get started. So I talked with him, I talked with Michael, and then we went and I started working with the program. Was there something that about it that particularly appealed to you or that you, you know, you had a passion about what he was doing? Because I, I mean, yeah. we have a lot of companies that come out of uh, the, the Upstart Now PCI Ventures program at Penn. Mm -hmm. A lot of terrific companies. Yes. And I'm sure you looked at a lot of different ones that were coming out of there. What, you know, what, was there something special about this company or what it does that appealed to you? Well, there were a couple of companies I was interested in, but this one really, what, what made the decision was my uncle Victor, he actually died in the hospital of a hospital acquired infection. And this product we're targeting for the hospitals. Uh, he was perfectly healthy, 78 year old man, he had fallen first time in the hospital, first ambulance ride, and what do you think? He never came out of the hospital. So that's wow. always been something that's bothered me. And I said, here's something I'm volunteering my time. Where can I contribute to? And maybe advance the science and do something. And it was wow. really there. And that's why I got involved with the no effect. And that was about three years, uh, three years and three months ago, actually. And uh, since then, I've been working with it. Uh, PCI Ventures has been great in helping us roll out the company. We formed the company. We then took it to 
where we licensed the technology and then the next stage was raise some money for it and now we're building the prototype. Yeah. Let me, um, so, so it, w if you look at your, um, your recent experience now acting as CEO for, the, for these two companies, what would you say has been your greatest challenge as a CEO of a, of a startup company or an early stage company? Looking at Minrad, look, uh, or looking at Safe Awake in this company, in effect in a mm -hmm. CEO role, they're early stage companies. Mm -hmm. A lot of venture money, a lot of private equities moved away from it. Uh, angels are skeptical to get involved. Because really, what, when you get involved at this early stage of a technology, with just the patent or PTC filed a patent, you're really, it's the investors taking an option on the technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's what you're really, as a CEO, selling is that option to say, I'm going to invest in this group and see where this technology is, and then we'll look at the next stage of possible success. So, and so are you saying that the, 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 the financing piece is really the most challenging aspect of what you're doing as a CEO for an early stage company? As in the CEO role, it yeah. is the most challenging aspect is the financing, to get that initial investment. But well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that in greater detail in a, in a little moment, but I know Charlie has some things he wants to talk to you about, too. That's Well, okay. yeah, let's start with Ineffect's business. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, Ineffect, we're experts in hand sanitization. And what we're working on is developing a device that you put your hands in and it applies through a specially patented application process, a sanitization solution. And it's very quick. In five seconds or less, it effectively sanitizes your hands, meaning it kills the bacteria that's on your hands. And, we're, and Dr. Axelson found in the hospital, in the ICU room, where you have five to ten times greater chance of catching an infection, this is where it can really be utilized by both doctors and nurses. So it's the ICU, not the operating room or the emergency room is where you're no. targeting? No, we're targeting, the, the operating room is very clean, there's lots of technologies there. We're now going to the ICU area of the hospital. Then we hope to diffuse down uh, to the rest of the hospital for use of our product, but we want to establish our beachhead in the ICU area. Mm -hmm. You know, you got 4,500 people a day coming out of these hospitals with an infection. That's about 1.6 million a year. Um, we're losing about 100,000 people a year to hospital-acquired infections. That's 273 people a day or one every six minutes. So it's a problem. The other side of the financial side is insurance companies are paying around 31 billion a year to hospitals these infections. So it's roughly about 18 to 20,000 per person that acquires an infection. And the government stepped in and how can you reduce that infection rate? So from a hospital side, we're looking in the future that it'll go from a revenue side to an expense side. And so there's going to be greater emphasis on this in the coming years uh, to reduce hospital infection rates, along with it's also being used as a measure by the government to rate hospitals one of the key parameters, what's your infection rate. And so that, that's another reason we can get in in this area, in the ICU room, and really have an impact, and then go from there with the product. Mm -hmm. So I know, uh, my wife's a nurse, and I know a few nurses, and I know that one of the things that is a challenge for them is they have to go between patient, patient to patient within the ICU. Yes. So pick up from there as to what, identify what is the issue right now that we're trying to fix, who else is in the marketplace, and then what would your potential proposed solution be? Okay. Right now, the the average facility that has an ICU has eight rooms or sixteen beds. Okay. And what happens is doctors and nurses they have to sanitize their hands. So the options now are to hand wash for thirty seconds, or use an alcohol or gel type material for twenty seconds. So if you have roughly sixteen beds. Uh, per hour, you're doing your rounds in the ICU, you're talking eight minutes hand washing or about six minutes uh, using the alcohol gel. Our proposal with the InEffect device is you put your hands in, count 1,001, 1, 1,002, 1, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, you're done, pull them out. Hmm. And the convenience is there for the doctors and nurses, and it's also for the visitors to the ICU room. And we hope to decrease the rate of hospital-acquired infections in that area. And, and the intellectual property that you've either developed or are developing around it? Yeah, Dr. Axelson developed uh, uh, 
filed the patent for this, uh, both the device and the hand sanitization solution. And what's nice is the way the patent's filed is this will be what, what we call a platform technology. There are many other products that will come out of this based on the proprietary hand sanitization solution uh, in the future. Um, it's going to be a tremendous opportunity and also it's really going to help out in the hospital environment and other environments. It's great. Um, uh, one of the issues that we frequently get into at some length on these shows is, is funding. You mentioned it previously and I told you we were going to come back to it in a little bit more detail, but I mean for a lot of companies that are in the life sciences, you know, they're not generating any income yet. They have to go through clinical trials and ultimately get FDA approval before they can um, uh, commercialize and actually get out there and start selling their products. So it's a long haul. And so people are frequently burning through cash and looking for more. You mentioned that earlier. Can you tell us a little bit about how you are funded and what your, you know, your plan is sort of in the near term and the long term going forward? Yeah. Uh, cur currently we're finding Novatorian Partners uh, here in, in Pennsylvania came in and funded us. Gary Barron, uh, Barron Innovation Group, they actually came in and they're funding what's called the, we call the proof of concept for validation of the technology. We're building the prototype, we're going to optimize the prototype, and then we're going to do the testing to complete the validation. We've teamed up with GMI Corporation uh, to actually build the product. Uh, with supporting them on a development side, we have Rose Hallman Ventures from Rose Hallman University, the number one undergraduate engineering school for 17 years in the United States, uh, helping us out. Well, also, the Praxair Corporation has come in, and they are going to help us out with the building of the device and the solution. Purifil is involved, and we have the Med Institute for regulatory side is all teamed up. Now, what we've been able to achieve most recently is a collaboration agreement to take it through development, regulatory approval, feasibility study, manufacturing, and product launch between the GMI Corporation and Praxair in in effect. And that's going to help us with the fundraising further as we go through these steps. Okay. Um, what would you say are the biggest barriers to entry into the industry that you're focusing on right now? Uh, one, once we get through the proof of concept and validate it, it's going to be the preclinical and clinical testing uh, for filing. We have to determine our regulatory route, uh, mm -hmm. file 5 to k combo device, and we're working on that right now, and we have a team looking at that. Uh, after that, in the med device area, you have to look at a feasibility study in the hospital to convince the hospitals to buy the product. So we have to complete that. Then we'll be able to manufacture the device and actually go forward. Uh, with the launch into the hospitals with a marketing and sales team. Okay. I wanted to ask you about uh, clinical trials. Are they needed for this? And if so, how? What? What do you need before you can commercialize this idea? That plan for both the preclinical work is to optimi optimize the device, we'll know where we're at, we'll do the clinical type work. But we really have to, right now, we're putting the plan together with a group to find out what we need and lay out the milestones that are necessary and the costs associated that with that. We may finance forward with a Series A or there may be another option for us. Right now that plan is being worked out in the January, February time frame. Okay. I'm looking at having an answer to that. But I want to bring in the experts to really look at you know which ways we should go and what our alternatives are go forward. I, I know in the, if I make him, and yeah, I, know please, in the, go ahead. I know in the past we've had some discussions about things being fast-tracked. I don't know whether that's the right terminology or not, but in other words, the government deems there is such a problem, let's say, with MRSA or with some, can they come out and say we're going to make your path to regulatory approval much easier? Or, or you know what I'm saying? Yes. It's, it's not a rule bending, but it's, it's a, we need this. There's a void in the marketplace, and get us there as quickly as you can, Tim. That's yes, that, that is possible, Charlie, and that's what we're looking at. When I say, you know, what are the alternatives, we're also looking at what the approval procedure is in Europe. Okay. We're working through the UK, potentially use UK as the launch pad, and we're bringing in groups there. You know, how can we combine both in the U.S. and over there in Europe and get 
through the regulatory path the fastest way. And maybe mm -hmm. one of the governments will pick it up. I don't know at this time. So is, are the clinical trials being conducted in the U.S. or in the U.K. or both? That decision hasn't been made yet. Okay. And that's, we decided rather than just push ahead, we're actually stepping back and putting together an entire plan and lining out our options forward on this regulatory journey forward. Uh, and also look at the feasibility study option. What's the best way to do that to convince the effectiveness of this product in the hospitals? Um, and just building a plan right now. Potentially, I also see, I'm sure you guys have looked at this, an application for the Department of Defense, right? Soldiers in the field. Uh, could be injured? Yes, we have. We, um, there, there's many government applications on the military side. Uh, this could be used in laboratories. Um, there's lots of different could applications there. Could be used at home. Yeah, yep. I was to say, it has, this has so many applications, it seems to me. Yes. Oh, in the future, it could be in the homes, it could be in high-end restaurants, a lot of different places. But we're, we're focused and headed forward for the hospital, where we think we can have the biggest impact sure. in the ICU to establish the beachhead and show the, how effective this device is. Uh, that's where we're focused our path and what, direction. What, what, would you, what would success look like? for in effect. I know you're at such an early stage, it's hard to say, but some people think they're going to start a company and run it forever. Some people are looking, you know, to take it to a point and go public or sell it. You know, what what would success look like for in effect? How would you define success? I define success as we get the, this technology and the products of the technology and the intellectual property out there for people to really utilize. Um, targeting specifically in the hospitals. If, uh, if we were in 70% of the hospitals in four to seven years in the ICUs being utilized and then we had about 30% in, in the rest of the hospital, uh, people using it here in the U.S. and then internationally growing in Europe and Asia and Latin America, that would be defined as success overall for the company. Whether that path is that we own the company or we end up partnering with someone or we end it end up getting a acquired, that's perfectly fine. Um, we want to get it out there you talk to benefit about society. It, I'm sorry, you talk about a platform as well. Um, yes. So maybe you don't have to develop every single application. You know, you let somebody else develop it for Department of Defense, the classroom, the home setting. Uh, yeah, you never know. Absolutely. And it, it, I would mention in defense, uh, Charlie, is it does kill Ebola. Hmm. So it can be, it's very effective there, and there, there may be interest there with the government. But right now, we're just focusing on the hospitals, and uh, we'll talk to the government agencies in the future. Best of luck. Right. Well, we're, we're actually at the end of our show. We're out of time. So I had a couple more questions for you. We could probably go for another <laughs> 15 minutes. But, <laughs> thank you. Um, but, uh, you know, that was great and appreciate it. Um, I'd like to thank our special guest, Tim Schaefer, who, for doing a great job this evening, and my co-host, uh, Charlie Huntington. Charlie, thank you, as always. Pleasure, appreciate your being here. Uh, the next guest on Money Matters will be Randy Taxon of United Retirement Advisors Group, who will be discussing Medicare and Medicare plans. Uh, Money Matters is now available as an audible uh, podcast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, listed as Money Matters, the podcast for mobile devices. The video is available on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. Thanks, thanks for watching this evening and we'll see you again next time.